Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Amy Kazimerchik, and I'm the curator of the Odd Dane Gallery. And on behalf of SFU Galleries, um, I'd like to welcome you to the first evening of the Gray on Gray Lecture Series, which is part of the public programming that converses with the exhibition Adorno's Gray by Hito Sterl. Adorno's Gray is curated by Melanie O'Brien with myself in collaboration with the SFU School for Contemporary Arts, supported by the Audain Visual Artist in Residence Endowment. Gray on Gray takes its title from a quotation in the preface to Hegel's The Philosophy of Right. When philosophy paints its gray and gray, a shape of life has grown old, and it cannot be re rejuvenated, but only recognized by the gray and gray of philosophy which is referenced by Peter Osborne in his conversation with Sterl on why Adorno may have painted his classroom gray. The title's slight shift to gray on gray also takes into consideration Goethe's theory of colors in which he observes how variably shades of gray are perceived depending on the shades they are placed behind, beside, or in front of. Goethe also makes observations on the colors that emerge at the edges between grays inspiring philosophers to consider the allegory of gray containing the full color spectrum. And so each gray on gray event excavates two of the four conceptual nodes in the constellation of Adorno's gray. Adorno's biography, monochrome painting, nude protest, and student protest. Tonight, Samir Gandesha takes up Adorno's biography in the colors of Adorno's thought and Jali Mansur monochrome painting in On Mono Monochromy and Repressive Tolerance, notes on post-World War II recrudescence of the revolutionary form. Two greys within Sterl's gradient, whose proximity tonight will mutually affect each other's rendering. Look for the array of colors produced where their edges overlap. Um, Samir will present first, followed by Jale, and after which we will invite them both up to the front for a conversation um, between them and yourselves about their two presentations. So I'm gonna give both of their um, introductory bios first and let the talks proceed from there. Samir Gandesha is Associate Professor of Modern European Thought and Culture in the Department of Humanities and the Director of the Institute for Humanities at Simon Fraser University. His writings have appeared in New German Critique, Philosophy and Social Criticism, Political Theory, Thesis 11, and in several edited volumes. He is a co-editor with Lars Rensman of Arendt and Adorno, Political and Philosophical Investigations, and is finishing a book with Johan Hartl on the poetry of the future, Marx and the Aesthetic. And Jali Mansour is Assistant Professor in the Department of Art History, Visual Art, and Theory at UBC, she received her PhD from Columbia University in 2007. Jale is currently working on two projects, one that addresses formal and procedural violence in the work of Alberto Burri, Lucio Fontana, and Piero Manzoni, and another on the problem of labor, value, and bare life in the work of Santiago Sierra and Claire Fontaine, among other contemporary practices that examine the limits of the human. So uh, join me in welcoming Samir Gandesha. Well, thanks so uh, much, Amy. I'd just like to take this opportunity um, to thank uh, both you and, uh, and Melanie O'Brien um, for curating this, uh, this fascinating work and, and also for bringing Hito Sterl to, to Vancouver um, for a very interesting talk uh, that she presented um, uh, about a week ago, two weeks ago, um, and also for inviting me here to speak uh, this evening. So. Thank you very much. Um, so my focus will pretty much be the um, relationship between theory and, and praxis uh, in Adorno and, and try and look at uh, some of the, uh, the resonances beyond, um, uh, beyond his thought as well, just uh, a little bit in, the, the, in my conclusions. Um, I didn't actually have a, uh, an opening slide, so this is just the slide for the, th the third part of the, uh, the, the talk. So. I'll flip back and forth a little bit in a second. <clears throat> so, in an essay written uh, between 1914 and 1915, and unpublished during his lifetime, Walter Benjamin writes that, quote, where color provides the contour, objects are not reduced to things, but are constituted by an order consisting of an infinite range of nuances, end quote. 
Reflecting on this short essay, Howard Cagle contends that Benjamin's thought can be said to be unified by this early understanding of color. Color, so conceived, deconstructs the opposition between subject and object, passive sensibility and active understanding. The deconstruction of the opposition between subject and object brings to the fore what Benjamin calls the language of things. Such a language makes things legible as a site at which nature and history converge. In his book on German Trauerspiel, or play of lamentation, random natural occurrences, such as the setting of the sun, for example, are to be read allegorically as historical events, such as the death of a tyrant. This idea of, lang of the language of things, based on an infinite range of nuances, provides us with a productive point of departure for approaching Hito Sterl's Adorno's Grey. The placement of things in a specific constellation or relation with one another makes those objects readable. It lets them speak and it prompts us to listen. Commenting on the implications of the language of things for documentary form, Stero claims in a 2006 essay, and it's a bit of a long quote, so bear with me. To engage in the language of things in the realm of the documentary form is not equivalent to using realist forms in representing them. It is not about representation at all, but about actualizing whatever the things have to say to us in the present. And to do so is not a matter of realism, but rather relationalism. It is a matter of presencing and thus transforming the social, historical, and also material relations which determine things." End quote. If the infinite nuances of color bring into play the language of things, then the language of things also must draw out the color of thought. Accordingly, the things Adorno's gray places in specific relations with one another, the layers of paint and plaster of the lecture theater, the monochrome, negative dialectics turned into a protest shield, draws out the other predominant colors of Adorno's thought. So Adorno's gray is framed by Adorno's red on the one side and by Adorno's black on the other. So turn to the, the first section. Uh, gray, one form of life become old. So this is the uh, passage that Amy was just referring to uh, that Peter Osborne talks about in, uh, in the piece. And I'm, I'm not going to read it. I'll let you just um, look through it. In Adorno's Grey, Peter Osborne refers to this passage as representing the color of philosophy or theory opposed to the richness of life as such. In it, Hegel suggests that philosophy cannot change the world but can only, can only interpret it by removing itself from a life that has unfolded historically. As Hegel says elsewhere in this text, philosophy must aim at grasping the rational as the actual and the actual as the rational. And it was over the meaning of precisely this passage that right and left wing followers of Hegel fought it out. The right concluded that philosophy's role was simply to discern the historical ruse of reason, always already embedded in the institutions of the modern world. While left Hegelians, including Ludwig Feuerbach, Bruno Bauer, Max Stirner, and of course Karl Marx, argued that reason had to be actualized. Philosophy had to be simultaneously negated as a separate and alienated activity and realized insofar as freedom as idea would finally be rendered actual. That is, practiced and not just thought. For the right, then, reason was a historical fait accompli. For the left, a cri de coeur, a demand that the actual world be made rational, which is also to say philosophical. Roughly 100 years later, Guy Debord took up the problem with which the Hegelian left, uh, with which the Hegelian left had grappled. Though this time, significantly displacing reason uh, by the two most influential wings of, 20th, of the 20th century avant-garde, in a way that nevertheless laid bare their ultimate failure. According to De Boer, Dada negated art without realizing it. Surreal, surrealism realized art without negating it. <clears throat> 
In contrast, for de Boer, the project to negate and realize philosophy now as art was a, pro was a program that the Situationist International sought to finally carry through in May 1968. In the aftermath of the experiences of the 20th century, Adorno challenges both the Hegelian left, including Marx, and the avant-garde in the famous opening to negative dialectics that philosophy lives on after the moment to realize it was missed. Philosophy could only properly continue to live on if it were supplemented by a form of art that actively resisted the impulse to return it to life. Hegel's philosophy was a timely philosophy par excellence. It painted its gray on gray precisely because philosophy was its own time grasped in concepts. And for Hegel, his time was a time at which the idea of freedom had taken shape in the institutions of the modern world, something that the right uh, certainly emphasized. The color of Adorno's philosophy is gray, not because of its timeliness per se, but rather because it was untimely. Hegel's timeliness had outlived itself and now had become belated. Adorno didn't so much juxtapose the gray of philosophy and the color of life, as Hegel had done, but rather, through philosophy, grasped life as itself gray and lifeless. The grayness of life is well captured in a section of Minima Moralia, uh, Adorno's reflections on damaged life that he wrote in, in Conditions of Exile, entitled Les Bourgeois Revenants, or the bourgeois ghost, that seems, as with much of this text, to read as a direct rejoinder to Hegel, whose fundamental categories were Geist, or spirit, and Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, often translated as civil society. And I quote, whatever was once, whatever once was good and decent, I could say civil, in bourgeois values, has been corrupted utterly. Privacy has given way to the privation it always was. The caring hand that even now tends the little garden as if it had not long since become a lot, but fearfully wards off the unknown intruder is already that which denies the political refugee asylum. Now objectively threatened, the subjectivity of the rulers and their hangers-on becomes totally inhuman. So the class realizes itself, taking upon itself the destructive course of the world." End quote. What Adorno is suggesting then is that the forms of spirit, geist, such as the bourgeois values and decency that he just referred to, had themselves in the condition of belatedness turned ghostly. As Adorno goes on to suggest, the bourgeois live on like specters threatening doom. Gray is the color then of a philosophy whose negation and realization misfired or failed. Hegel sought to lay bare the self-formative process whereby spirit or geist externalized itself in the world confronted the products of its own conceptual labor as alien, and then re-internalized these products in the fullness of its own life. Negative dialectics is a philosophy written against Hegel, appropriate to a world in which life itself had drained away. Life, as Adorno puts it in the very epigram to Minima Moralia, does not live. Underlying the prevalent health, Adorno writes, is death. All the movements of health resemble the reflex movements of beings whose hearts have stopped beating." End quote. As he shows in his reading of Beckett's Endgame, and elsewhere, nature reverses into history insofar as it has no right to exist outside of its ability to serve human purposes and needs, while history itself becomes naturalized, a second nature, and therefore ever more locked into the blind reproduction of the ever the same. <laughs>
Panic breaks once again, Adorno argues, after millennia of enlightenment over humanity whose control of nature as control of men far exceeds in horror anything men ever had to fear from nature. Quote. And this involves a double bind. As nature's historicity or temporality is marked by the spiraling of increasingly momentous events, such as the splitting of the atom, more recently anthropomorphic climate change, we could say, the events of history become, through the reproduction of a dominating form of subjectivity, ever more reduced to a mere second nature, effectively bringing the dialectic to a standstill. While for Hegel, history ends or culminates in a vibrant living freedom, in a whole that is true, for Adorno, in contrast, in late capitalist society, it culminates in a life that had become the ideology of its absence. That the destructive tendencies of the masses that explode in both varieties of the totalitarian state are not so much death wishes as manifestations of what they have already become. They murder so that whatever to them seems living shall resemble themselves." End quote. I'll turn to the second section, um, red, revolutionary ambivalence. So as I've already suggested then, Adorno positioned himself critically both towards the Marxist tradition on the one hand and the historical European avant-garde on the other. Assuming such a position of negativity towards both of these traditions was bound to appear as a deliberate provocation to the revolutionary students for whom political vanguardism and aesthetic avant-gardism became particularly as its militancy deepened ever more closely fused together in direct action. The so-called Busen Attentat, referenced in this piece, crystallizes elements of both, I think. While it appears as a bizarre, absurd, and ultimately, I think, unseemly coda to Adorno's academic intellectual life, its tremendous impact on the institutions of post-war Germany and post-war German educational institutions, uh, uh, higher educational institutions, it was, in fact, symptom symptomatic of something far more sinister in, in, in the air in Germany at the time. What I'd call the strange afterlife of a fascism that was no longer fully alive, but also not quite dead yet. Behind its inherent absurdity was a, menace, a menacing aspect of the Busenattentat, the breast attack, that remains absent from the piece, although I think it is hinted at in the, in the timeline. In this lecture course in, entitled An Introduction to Dialectical Thinking, which had attracted growing numbers of students to it, close to something like a thousand, uh, Adorno nonetheless sought to create conditions for genuine dialogue. And this is fitting because uh, he uh, more than once drew attention to the, the origins of dialectic in dialogue. Right? So uh, it's quite fitting. So in, and he, he, created the, he sought to create the conditions for such um, dialogue by allowing students to put questions to him at any time during the course of his lectures. Right? So here at SFU or UBC, I mean, this is something that we would do without thinking, but in the German academy, even to this day, that's quite unusual to open it to students like this. Uh, so this was something, it wasn't nothing, that's for sure. But far from creating the context for the meaningful exercise of the public use of reason, or mundigkeit, coming from the word for mouth, mund, ability to speak or speak up for oneself, however, this openness was hijacked by the students. So, on April 22nd, at the inaugural, inaugural lecture, members of the so-called leather jacket fraction um, of the SDS demanded that Adorno engage in a kind of ritualistic self-criticism for having called in the police to clear the institute of the student occupiers several months earlier. One of them wrote on the blackboard, if Adorno is left in peace, capitalism will never cease. Shortly afterwards, he was set upon by the three young women and probably like the theater, the rest, as we know, is history. In her off-camera ca commentary, Nina Power poses a question as to whether uh, this actually caused Adorno's death, as the legend had 
held. Whether this causes biological death is indeed an open question, although its very openness seems to suggest a kind of prudishness um, that never characterized uh, this public advocate for, amongst other things, the repeal of anti-sodomy laws in the Federal Republic. I mean, Adorno was no prude, and Nina Power, you know, she, she does point that out, I think. But one thing is clear, shortly after the, the breast attack, Busen Attentat, a pamphlet circulated amongst the students with the slogan um, that ran, as an institution, Adorno is dead. So. I think the interesting thing about, uh, about this piece is it really does challenge that. It challenges the, that institutional death of, of, of Adorno in certain ways. So at this stage, this event, and in particular, the statement on the blackboard may have appeared simply as an idle threat, a mere suggestion of, you know, of vague Oedipal wishes of some of the more hardline students. Yet with their progressive radicalization and increasing propensity to use violence, the statement and the event takes on, retrospectively, somewhat more sinister meaning. And I'll turn to that in just a second. Upon their return from exile in 1949, Horkheimer and Adorno were an inspiration for the budding opposition in the Federal Republic of Germany. Pirated copies of Dialectic of Enlightenment circulated at the Institute for Social Research against the wishes of Horkheimer, in particular, who, who was in the process of reestablishing the Institute, uh, and who felt that the resurfacing of that text in particular might damage the Institute's reputation. Nevertheless, for the students, Adorno's, and to, to, a certain, uh, to, to a slightly lesser extent, Horkheimer's theses, which were disseminated throughout the 1950s and 1960s via public and radio um, addresses on such questions as uh, was ist Deutsch, what is German, the meaning of uh, working through the past, um, education for enlightenment, education for, uh, for Mundigkeit, as, uh, Put it, um, as well as through philosophical and sociological seminars, Dorno and Horkheimer were a profound um, influence and in inspiration. As was Adorno's tireless work of university uh, reform, in particular um, in the establishment of sociology as a critical and reflective rather than simply administrative uh, discipline in the Federal Republic. Right? And th this is quite well documented by a book by uh, um, Alex. Uh, um, uh, the name is, is now escaping me. I'll come back to it. You gave it to me, Jerry. <laughs> um, Demirovich, Alex Demirovich, um, the nonconformist intellectuals. So this is documented in a very thick book. Um, Adorno's intellectual contributions, of course, um, concerned the damaging impact of positivism on the humanities, the intertwinement of enlightenment and myth, the persistence of authoritarian personality structures within late capitalism, and the way in which leisure time was, had become merely the extension of the crippling drudgery of work. All of these seem to directly hit the mark in a society in the throes of its so-called economic miracle, or Wirtschaftswunder that seemed to crystallize what Joseph Schumpeter had called capitalism's logic of creative destruction. The fact that its industrial base had been laid waste during the war made it possible for the Federal Republic of Germany to create with Japan one of the most technologically advanced and competitive economies of the emerging global order. And uh, obviously it's got some staying power, unlike the rest of Europe. What seemed to have been destroyed, as the students were quickly, becoming, uh, quickly beginning to realize, was not just the obsolete fixed capital accumulated accumulated during the first late wave of German industrialization around the time of the Franco-Prussian War, but also, as was pointed out by a number of writers, including the Mitzerlichs and uh, um, W.G. Sebald, was the capacity, so what was being destroyed was a capacity for German society to mourn the victims of the catastrophe and to genuinely work through the past. Moreover, it seemed that in 1967, especially um, uh, that the, the thesis of the totally administered society seemed to have exactly hit the mark in the formation of the so-called Grosse Coalition, or the Grand Coalition between the SDP and the CDU. One of the key pieces of legislation passed by this government was the, uh, the so-called emergency law, Notstandgesetz, um, in 1968, that severely curtailed civil liberties as a way of clamping down on the growing disaffection amongst and militancy of the students. It was painfully reminiscent 
of Article um, 48 of the Weimar Constitution that made it possible for the Nazis to come to power via democratic means. It was against this set of developments that the APO, or the extra-parliamentary opposition, um, was brought into being via the SDS, or the German Socialist Students' Union. Yet at, so yet at the very moment that the students drew upon critical theory to inform their political activities, they also came to call into question Adorno's own avowed distance from political praxis, which was in a sense the condition of critical theory in the first place. The students' impatience was compounded by two events in particular. The first was the shooting of Benno Onesorg at a, at a peaceful protest against the Shah of Iran on June 2nd, 1967, during which the students were set upon by the police, culminating in the shooting death of a young student attending his very first political rally. The second followed just a few months later. This was the attempted assassination of the SDS APO leader, Rudi Dutschke, on April 11th, 1968, by a right-wing extremist. The students with real justification held the culture industry, notably the right-wing media, the Springer Press in particular, um, responsible for stirring up uh, anti-student sentiment, which Adorno himself compared to the pogroms directed against the Jews in the 1920s and 1930s. These events therefore seem to demonstrate to the students the authoritarian, if not downright fascistic character of a state that no had not even posed the need to work through the past. Indeed, many prominent former Nazis had achieved positions of power and influence in the Federal Republic. And the frustration with Adorno, uh, in particular, came to a head when the students occupied Frankfurt, uh, the University of Frankfurt and the offices of the Institute for Social Research um, in December 1968. Their aim was supposedly to break with what they considered to be an education oriented to produce um, the integrated alibis of the authoritarian state. Despite the, the demands of the students to smash the academic machine, Adorno and his colleagues, such as Jürgen Habermas, sought to keep the dialogue open with the students, but to no avail. Subsequently, Adorno even sought to invite Marcuse to the University of Frankfurt in the hope that um, uh, uh, this figure, um, who enjoyed a much less uh, equivocal reputation amongst the radicals, would be able to mediate between um, the professors and uh, the radical wing of the students. Despite these efforts to engage in ongoing discussion with the students, the most radical factions among them continued to agitate, now for the expropriation of the Institute for Social Research uh, means of production, its furnishings and its equipment. The students under the leadership of Adorno's own doctoral student, Hans Jürgen Kral, sought to carry out this action on January 31st. The directors of the Institute, with Adorno at its head, met this threat directly and called in the police to protect the autonomy of the institution. In the justification for their, uh, of their actions, the institute's directors argued, I'm, there's a bit of a longish quote, it is vital that precisely those who believe that university reform is overdue and who wish to bring about a democratic and social institution in harmony with the basic law, the constitution, it is vital precisely for those who identify wholeheartedly with this aim of the extra parliamentary opposition that they should feel obligated to resist their own criminalization. They should resist all authoritarian tendencies and equally all pseudo-anarchistic uh, pseudo acts of violence on the part of the ostensibly left-wing activists, as well as the crypto-fascist actions from groups from the far right." End quote. It is here that Adorno's difficult relation to the history of the left crystallizes. Since the middle of the 19th century, if not earlier, the left had adopted the color red as its own. It had come to signify praxis itself in the passionate suffering bodies of the men and women who were the real subjects of the historical processes, Marx wrote in the German ideology. Red referred moreover to the blood of the workers spilled by the reactionary forces in cities throughout Europe, not least cities such as uh, Frankfurt am Main itself, in which a significant historical battle had raged to establish a genuinely representative constitutive assembly, assembly during the revolutions of 1848. It was here that, as, as I alluded to uh, um, uh, a few minutes ago, that the Hegelian left sought to make the world philosophical by realizing and negating philosophy in terms of republican politics. Some 50 years later in Russia, revolutionary opposition to the Tsar was divided between the whites, or the Mensheviks, who tended to be gradualists, who believed that what was required was a development of the productive forces to the point where revolution would be possible. 
and the Reds, or the Bolsheviks, who, with the example of the, the Paris Commune clearly in mind, believed that the historical development that believed that historical development in Russia could be telescoped, and hence power could be decisively taken in the present rather than in some uh, infinitely open future. While breaking with praxis understood in Leninist terms, theoretically Adorno, as I've tried to uh, suggest already, remains very much in the tradition of historical materialism. His characterization of Marx's capital as the phenomenology of the anti-spirit, as what he called the ontology of the wrong state of things, could be said to have characterized the totality of his own writings. Adorno roots his understanding of the violence done by identity thinking to the non-identical in the penetration of exchange value into virtually every nook and cranny of the administered world. Adorno argues that the violence done by the concept, or again, identity thinking, was, to ult was ultimately to be grounded in the domination of, exchange, of, of use by exchange value. Just as Nietzsche had located the structure of ascetic subjectivity itself in the capacity to remember debts. Social domination for Adorno was inextricable from the domination of nature. Philosophy manifested in abstract form the natural historical logic of, de of devouring and being devoured. Philosophy was belly-turned mind. So the ambivalence of the students towards Adorno was reflected by his own ambivalence uh, toward the demand that theory and practice be unified in revolutionary political action. Hans-Jürgen Kral, remember Adorno's own graduate student, captures this tension perfectly when he uh, relates. When we, were besieged, uh, when we were besieging the Council of Frankfurt University, the only professor who came to the students' sit-ins was Professor Adorno. He was overwhelmed with, devotion, uh, with ovations. He made straight for the microphone, and just as he reached it, he ducked past and shot into the philosophy seminar. In short, once again, on the threshold of practice, he retreated into theory. In Adorno's view, this view that, uh, this demand that theory be unified with uh, praxis was in league with the now ubiquitous claim that what does not in some way serve measurable social utility had lost its right to exist. Yet with the increasing violence that the students saw directed against them, marked by the shootings of Onosorg and Duchka, a faction of the student movement became convinced that nonviolent opposition had reached its very limits. That the very generation that had orchestrated Auschwitz was not going to be swayed by nonviolent tactics. In a moment of decision, of what they themselves described as a moment of madness, I think this is a, a Gudrun Enslin's words, they proceeded to play out what Freud had called Nachträglichkeit, or deferred action. The armed resistance of the militant wing of the students could be said to have manifested the repressed resistance of their parents. Paradoxically, it was by actualizing this deferred resistance that the earlier generation had refused that the students established distance from their parents, whom they viewed as compromised as a generation. Nachträglichkeit marked, in this case, therefore, a generational caesura. Yet while it undoubtedly contained fascist elements within it, the Federal Republic could no, long, could no more be characterized as a fascist state than could Italy or Japan. And in this revolutionary pantomime, the Rote Armee Fraktion, the Red, the Red Army fa uh, Faction, or RAF, RAF, mirrored the actions of their comrades in the two other former Axis powers, the Japanese Red Army and uh, Brigade Rosse, Red Brigades in Italy. The RAF began its campaign of seeking to, as they said, explode a bomb in the consciousness of the people by launching a frontal attack on consumer culture by firebombing two Frankfurt department stores in April of 1968. And this chain of events would then expand to include the bombing of US bases in Heidelberg, the hijacking of a Lufthansa flight in Somalia, and culminated in the kidnapping and assassination of the head of the German Business Association president and former high-ranking Nazi official responsible for forced labor, Hans Martin Schleyer, in October 1977. If, if Hegel had argued that philosophy could only understand post-festum, after the feast or after the event, reality's formative process with the RAF, philosophy is almost completely displaced by action or praxis. Hell, 
Yes, it's all about praxis, wrote an enthusiastic Andreas Bader in a letter to his lover and comrade, Enslin. It is perhaps a very beautiful historical irony that Enslin herself was a, was a granddaughter of the granddaughter of none other than the philosopher Hegel. In this, a certain chapter of German intellectual and political history comes to a close. From Hegel's emphatic insistence, as we have already seen, on the essentially interpretive vocation of philosophy to his mid-20th century heirs, almost unthinking, unreflective turn to unmediated direct action. Indeed, as many of you will no doubt know, Hegel devoted an important chapter of the phenomenology to absolute freedom and the terror of the French Revolution, arguing that it was precisely in the Jacobins' lack of understanding of the need for mediation or differentiation in their understanding of politics that led the revolution, chronos-like, to devour its own children. Of course, with the German students, the situation was the exact inverse. Here, the children sought to devour their own parents. But there is a certain logic to this. If Marx drew attention to the contradiction between the most advanced theory on the one hand and socioeconomic backwardness in 19th century Germany, that unlike France, Germany had made revolutions only in its head, now we see a kind of reversal, a society that was quickly becoming one of the most socioeconomically and technologically advanced nations in the world seem now to be able to dispense with thought altogether. In their willingness to sacrifice all to their cause, to put their bodies and indeed lives on the line for anti-capitalist resistance, the members of the RAF undertook what can only be seen as an essentially religious struggle. When asked, for example, about the meaning of his daughter's participation in the bombing campaign, Enslin's father, who's also related, no doubt, to Hegel, uh, who was a pastor, said that he believed that it constituted a kind of holy self-realization. Not only did this um, simultaneous self-assertion and self-subordination not challenge authoritarianism, it seemed at a deep psych psychological level, on the contrary, to reproduce its conditions. And the authoritarianism of both was constituted, at least in part, by refusal and possibly a lack of capacity to engage in a public use of reason. Adorno's critique of the violent tendencies of the students was consistent with his understanding of the self-destruction of enlightenment, that in seeking to master a terrifying nature outside of itself, the subject mirrors and internalizes the very terror which it then practices against itself. In a similar way, in its attempt to confront fascism by using its own tools against it, the radical arm of the students reproduced rather than working um, uh, uh, towards genuinely confronting and transcending it. So what I've tried to suggest then is that Adorno's thought retains the color gray with the historical failure of the Reds, that is the Bolsheviks and the Spartacists, to make the world philosophical by simultaneously negating and realizing philosophy. For Adorno, the moment, for, for Adorno, the moment of this failure, at the moment of this failure, praxis is not itself abolished, but rather displaced through the autonomous artwork whose color had turned black. So, uh, final section. So the historical failure of the moment to realize philosophy, to make the actual rational, lends Adorno's thought a tone of lamentation or trower. In his dedication of Minima Moralia, his reflection on the damaged life of the intellectual emigre, as, as I mentioned, to his close collaborator and friend Max Horkheimer. Adorno characterizes his thought as a melancholy science, a trauriger Wissenschaft. Such thought aspires to raise the world's agony to a conceptual level in such a way that would explode concepts um, or explode uh, 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 an inver introverted conceptual thinking. If Adorno begins negative dialectics with the claim that the moment to realize philosophy was missed and therefore the way to realize philosophy was via an unremitting negativity, then such negativity could only be manifested via artworks that refuse to be made a functional part of the existing order. Genuine artworks manifested an internal purposefulness relating parts within the whole, yet they were, they were ultimately purposeless in themselves insofar as they stepped out of the means ends relations of empirical society. If art could be said to embody a purpose, it lay precisely in its active disavowal of social purposes. The function of art was to be dysfunctional and as such constituted what Adorno called 
the splinter in the eye that served as the best magnifying glass. Yet art, in its very expressiveness, remained mute, unable to articulate its truth content, and therefore stood in need of philosophical or conceptual explication. Philosophy, in contrast, could, through concepts, communicate contents, yet without art's expressiveness, would only subsume such sensuous content through the logic of identity, or the exchange logic of the very society it wished to confront critically. Philosophy on the one side, art on the other, crystallized experience not so much in terms of overarching, uh, totalizing concepts, but in terms of its micrological detail. If the color red came to signify in the post-war period either a communism that had degenerated into Stalinism on the one hand, or the various armed insurrectionary groups on the other, such as, such as the, the Red Army faction, as I said, the Japanese Red Army, the Red Brigades, then what comes to supplant red as a genuine site of negativity was a form of art whose color was black. As Ad Reinhardt states, and it's listed on the, the, the uh, timeline, in, so in 1962, black is interesting not as a color, but as a non-color, as the absence of color. In other words, black manifested this indefatigable negativity for Adorno. On the face of it, it appears that Adorno, in turning from red to black, could not have been farther from the students. After all, in a late essay, dating from the time of his composition of aesthetic theory entitled Subject and Object, he allows himself the rare opportunity to speak of what a, reconcil what a reconciled condition might look like, a condition of nonviolence or peace between subject and object, based on genuinely communicative relations between them. Such relation would be based, though, on the paradoxical strengthening of an ego that, in its very strength, stood capable of, relinqu of relinquishing itself and to genuinely open itself to the other. Peace, in a sense, could only be brought about dialectically, that is, by way of, as Adorno put it, the very cold rationality without which Auschwitz would not have been possible. Peace, in other words, required the very rationality it ultimately sought to transcend. But perhaps Adorno wasn't quite so far from the most radical uh, faction of the students, as it first might appear to be the case. While Ador Adorno supported the SDS against the SDP's adoption of the emergency law, he certainly never approved of the violence, uh, approved of violence as the means of uh, political action. Nonetheless, perhaps we can think the relation between Adorno and the radical wing of the students in the following terms. What these students wanted to carry out directly was, as I've already suggested, exploding reified consciousness by way of brazen, ever more brazen acts of political violence. Adorno saw as possible only in a highly sublimated form via the autonomous work of art and its criticism. In a sense, the black melancholy artwork reflects back the color, or better, the non-color, the negativity of a world whose heart had stopped beating. In expression, Adorno argued, works of art reveal themselves as the wounds of society. Art was, therefore, an uncommitted crime, one that becomes as enigmatic as the terror born of the primordial world, which, though it metamorphoses, does not disappear. All art remains a seismogram of that terror." End quote. Adorno argues that art objects kill what they objectify by tearing it away from the immediacy of its life. Without this admixture of poison, art becomes virtually the negation of life. Sorry, without this admixture of poison, virtually the negation of life, the opposition of art to civilization would amount to nothing more than impotent comfort, culture industry. What can be heard, Adorno argues, in even the greatest works of aesthetic unity is the echo of social violence. So Adorno's notion of authentic works as preserving and mediated form the experience of what he calls primordial shudder, the terror of confronting a, na uh, confronting a nature that has not yet been brought under almost total human control, was in some ways not that far removed from the Raff's idea of exploding bombs in the consciousness of the people. However, while the students took this literally, Adorno showed throughout his aesthetic theory the way in which this explosive Dionysian impulse had to enter into the very formal constitution of the artwork, which itself stood in need 
of philosophical explication and ultimately the public use of reason in order to express the inexpressible. As Adorno states, and I quote, the critique exercised a priori by art is that of action as a cryptogram of domination. According to its sheer form, praxis tends towards that which, in terms of its own logic, it should abolish. Violence is maintained, um, to, uh, maintained in it and is maintained in its sublimations, whereas artworks, even in their most aggressive, stand for nonviolence. I'm just going to finish now. In a sense, the sublimated force of the artwork that has resisted all social functions has become, that has in a sense become dysfunctional, is brought to a head in the closing moments of Adorno's Grey, in the image of the book Block Activist, who used negative dialectics, a philosophy whose necessary supplement, as I've suggested, was the autonomous artwork, to break out of the police line. Perhaps this can be read as allegorizing Adorno's fundamental philosophical intention in negative dialectics, to use the very strength of rational subjectivity to break out, to engage in an Ausbruch of a form of sacrificial subjectivity that, supports, that subordinates external nature and its own sensual, sensuous impulses as well as other human beings to the reproduction of the false logic of the social whole. It would seem that the story that Adorno had his lecture theater painted gray is an urban legend. However, what is clear is that Hito Sterel takes up Adorno's own apocryphal stance and by, as it were, painting her gray on white, lays bare the intertwinement of art and philosophy. In so doing, she approximates the very blackness of an art that aims at keeping alive, as Adorno states, in the very last sections of Negative Dialectics. A resistance of the eye which doesn't want the colors of the world to fade. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, I just want to say how earnestly honored I am to be presenting after that very inspiring paper. So many, many thanks for that. And also I'd like to, uh, I really can't express my gratitude enough at this singular chance to uh, present on the eccentric conjuncture among gender politics, radical materialist feminism, aesthetic theory, and political economy. So uh, this is a, a very rare evening. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to Melanie O'Brien and Amy Kuzmerchik for, for this invitation. Thank you. Uh, so, Hito Styrell's project traces a diagram of modernist ambivalence, seems to be the theme of the evening, around the problem of opacity and transparency. Opacity and transparency of information, of the material support, of meaning, of reference, and of working bodies. Styrell, the historian, notes the degree to which this ambivalence plays out over the female body, dramatically symptomatized by the events of Adorno's last lecture and the events that led up to Eve Klein's final cardiac arrest. Interesting, interesting coincidence, she traces. I use the word symptom to denote the way, this, the way that Styrell situates both occurrences less as events and more as part of the etiology of modernism. Now this arena for modernism's civil war, the female body, is a motivated one insofar as the modernist aesthetic tropes with which Styrell is preoccupied were forged from the loss of the body to the visual field. We might think of 1910 as an event for which the rest of modernism attempts to recover. I'm showing you a work dating to 1910 by Pablo Picasso uh, entitled Girl with a Mandolin, Fanny Tellier. The beginnings of abstraction, or when representation is fully severed from the horizon of a worldly referent, are often dated to around 1910 and in Cubism. Art historian Rosalind Krauss has described this moment as, quote, a sense of the withdrawal of touch from the field of vision experienced by Picasso as a passionate relation to loss. That the carnal objecthood of the model, 
And note here, the breast is the only place of dimension suggesting itself as phenomenologically present, was withdrawing progressively, and that this loss was felt not as a triumph, but as a kind of poignant tragedy registered in Picasso's work from 1910 through 1911 by the way that work clings to the human figure, and not just any figure, but those of Picasso's friends and lovers. One of the greatest monuments of this withdrawal is surely the figure of Girl with a Mandolin. In the displacement of the representation of the velvety substance of the nude's breast, the form that should carry it, to the empty space behind the figure, we are forced to compare, to compare a place of carnal pleasure become a flattened, jagged shape hung away from the body and a patch of empty, negative space. In the exquisite irony of that comparison, we might glimpse something of the feelings that drove Picasso as he watched the outcome of his own visual conviction, as he watched depth and touch disappear quite literally from sight. I therefore think we have to read Picasso's declaration around that time that his love is something he would have to write in his paintings and I'm showing you Majoli from one year later, as something extraordinarily charged. For it to have gotten to the point that the carnal dimension, depth, painting's entire point, is so unavailable to one of the most accomplished figure painters of his age, and that he would have to render his passion by writing it on the picture plane, is certainly one of the greatest ironies in the history of painting. But it is also its great watershed." End quote. The split between vision and touch structuring the break between representation and the concrete field of the real opens on to the search for another kind of motivation, one to be found within the material parameters of the support itself. The years 1915 through 1922, marked by Malevich's black square at the start and Rochenko's triptych, pure colors, red, yellow, and blue, established the monochrome as the dominant paradigm of radical painting. The trope resurfaced with charged meaning again in the aftermath of World War II between 1947 and 1966. I'm showing again Rochenko's primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and on the right, Eve Klein's uh, mono pink, mono gold, mono blue from 1956. Uh, and the monochrome uh, surfaces again recently, suggesting the unfinished business of the 20th century. To start at the start, while Malevich referred to the black square as the royal infant born of stage design for the play Victory Over the Sun, Rochenko had this to say, quote, this is the end of painting. These are the primary colors. Every plane is a discrete plane, and there will be no more representation." End quote. When Rochenko declared the end of painting in 1921 by presenting his triptych, three panels of primary color were a tactical way to demystify a 400-year-old practice of oil-based pigments applied on canvas associated with an aristocratic hegemon appropriated by the bourgeoisie. By rationalizing painting as a function of basic and universally available qualities, a surface, the fundamentals of unmixed and unskilled color, its creation could be available to all. The Brechtian principle of the author as worker warded off any excess of material praxis, however excess may be understood, as creativity, as spirit, as magic, as genius, or as subjective and expressive interiority. Despite its reduction of painting to parameters supposedly free of such excess that might compromise the immediate materialist message, Rochenko's triptych still evidenced faith in the notion of pure color, which by 1921 no longer existed given the manufacture of industrial pigment. In other words, despite its aspirations to the transparency of meaning and means, a transparency that traded that of the Renaissance understanding of painting as a window for a transparency founded on truth to materiality 
equal and available to all, Rochenko's model of revolutionary making actually masked its own commodity status. Caught in the sliding glass door of its own aspirations or its own blind spot, the work forfeited both the possibility of sensuous immediacy with which painting had been historically imbued, as well as the very political horizon to which it was to speak. This model of transparency to materials and to process prefigures class composition founded on other opacities. And I would just like to point out that the 20s is the moment where the uh, model of the worker as semi-skilled, the, the worker from the 19th century, is giving way to the new mass worker, the new worker of tailorization. We might situate Rochenko's paradigmatic monochrome as the first portrait of an object's material trajectory. And I'd just like to remind you that Styrell had described her videos as portraits and narratives of objects, in which, for instance, we saw the detritus of a, car, of a crashed plane providing the material support for a film about a plane crash, in a kind of circular logic. Rochenko relies on a telos in which his work is an endpoint, whereas Styrell sees materials operating in a Mobius strip, to use her terms, of cause and effect. This shift from telos to circuit marks something of the history of, of relationship to materiality across the 20th century. How it started out with a belief in infinite growth and ended in an economy of recycling. What both Rochenko's teleological narrative and Styrell's topological narrative conceal are the cultural and affective loss on which this same transparency is founded. And this truth was a high price to pay, if only because it too was unattainable. Fidelity to the medium entailed as much a kind of seizure of totality, evidenced in Malevich's black square, or his red square, as an objective acknowledgement of the concrete limits of the medium. But above all, it was a high price to pay because the promise, de, the promise de bonheur of beauty, or the promise that vision would open onto sensuousness, was never recoverable, even in the rappel à l'ordre that Picasso himself participated in, as did uh, Malevich. But there's another way of negotiating the body's relationship to the field of representation, one that acknowledges the extent to which opacity the extent to which the opacity transparency dialectic is entwined as much with the commodity as with material and reference. Put another way, the whole problem of transparency to the limits of the medium seemed already by 1910, if not much earlier as evidenced by uh, Degas' Little Dancer of 14, which dates to the 1880s, seemed already pointless in the wake of the shop window's supremacy over the window as spiritual metaphor. Again, the metaphor that had uh, informed the history of painting from the Renaissance up through the 19th century. Marcel Duchamp was on to this trade-off early. My favorite example of a work complicating transparency in the face of the commodity is Fresh Widow, dating to 1920 wherein the transparency of the planes of glass are traded for leather panels the collector is instructed to polish. The Renaissance metaphor for painting as window onto a transcendental, transcendental world become vehicle for fetishistic desire in the, form, in the form of onanistic tactility. The joke is on the window's capacity to open onto metaphorical value in an era of quick and interchangeable parts. Transparency and opacity are set into play as a problem of the fetish, understood in both psychoanalytic terms as the erotically invested object, and in Marxian terms as the commodity fetish. Fresh Widow is signed not Marcel Duchamp, but Rose Selavi, Duchamp's alter ego. Rose Selavi is, of course, a way of talking about Eros Selavi, or Eros is life. In this regard, Duchamp prefigures not only the insight of a collapse in any notion of medium transparency under the regime of the market's opacity, but also something of the Frankfurt School's mourning for the originary loss subtending the new object matrix. Eros, embodiment, touch, pleasure, 
the qualities informing the history of the nude, among other genres, before the advent of modernism. Fresh, Widow's di Fresh Widow diagrams a continuous passage between a melancholic preservation of painting and a simultaneous yielding to a new object status of industrial manufacture, which, at least for a moment along Rochenko's horizon, meant transparency to democratization. But in the US context, and already under uh, NEP in the Soviet context, transparency simply spoke to consumerism and what Molly Nesbitt has called the tyranny of the shop window. As I mentioned, Rochenko blithely forgot about the market determination of his primary colors. Commodity fetish aside, the dissonance between transparency and opacity informs any number of post-World War II forms of abstraction. So again, while Duchamp may have demonstrated the practical impossibility of transparency, either material or ideological, as early as 1920, which is to say a year in advance of Rochenko's monochrome, it took most painters until the post-World War II era during the golden age of capitalist subsumption in both Europe and America to acknowledge the entwinement of the medium, the market, and the unconscious. The golden era of the post-war boom is also the second golden era of the monochrome. After the Second World War, between 1947 and 1966, Artists involved with the revival of the monochrome